CSDS and uh, IRASEC uh, are very pleased to receive today uh, Pinkeo Langaransri, uh, who is an anthropologist, uh, assistant professor at the Department of uh, Sociology and Anthropology of uh, Chiang Mai University. And she is the author also of a very interesting book, uh, which is named uh, Redefining uh, Nature, uh, Current Ecological Knowledge and Challenge to the Modern Conservation Paradigm. paradigm. And uh, I think uh, today she will uh, present uh, us the process through which um, the, of the construction of a notion of nature close to what uh, the scholar called the naturalist uh, ontology, uh, which is the great uh, divide between uh, nature and culture. So please. Yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming. Um, what I'll be talking about today, as I think you already uh, uh, introduced, is part of my my book and also my dissertation. And it was like, I guess 15, 16 years ago. So rereading this book again, you know, in uh, 2017, um, and you know, find that the situation in Thailand can still be explained by this book. So it's quite amazing, you know, it's either Thailand has never moved forward, or maybe um, uh, you know the, this issue, the politics of nature conservation, you know, has not been uh, has not changed at all, you know, in decades. So uh, for me, I you know let me look at let's uh, look at uh, this picture for instance. Um, seven years ago, I you know I also went to a court um, uh, like this, you know, defending a current uh, villager, you know, who was arrested by. Forester of cutting, you know, uh, timber in the forest, and see, you know, <coughs> in last year, you also see uh, this kind of uh, incident, you know, uh, 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 happen. You know, it's, it's been quite um, a very, a very uh, interesting phenomenon. You know, and point to the very interesting question that the idea that nature cannot be uh, recited by certain group of people is still very predominant. The mind of foresters as well as the public. So, what I like to uh, sort of do today is to. This is one chapter in this book, and there there's no other chapter that uh, talk about uh, you know the politics of forester as well. But today I'll be you know focusing on the knowledge politics. Uh, the approach that I use in this book is to trace back the idea of nature to Thailand and see. How it has changed through time. It was back in the uh, uh, 1990s, the debate was divided, you know, between the two camps. Right? On the one hand, you have this nature conservationist aligned with uh, forest authority, <coughs> who claim that nature itself is very is pure and primordial. You know, it has its own law of nature, which cannot be. Uh, intervene or we should not be uh, you know touched by people and on, on the other hand you have this um, local people and um, community right based activists who try to propose the idea of uh, people uh, management of nature or, or forest right? um, the debate has not been resolved you know until now because you look at this incident I'm not sure you follow the issue or not but last year uh, the village in this area, the houses and properties were burned, burned down by foresters, um, who claim that uh, you know this national park you know has long been intact until these uh, recent uh, immigrants from Burma came to Lesotho to settle in, in the area. So um, the court back in 1995, and I, I, I used this uh, as the beginning of uh, the. the the chapter that I wrote in this thesis, it points to a very, a very interesting idea that, you know, for somehow, uh, nature conservationists and foresters alike uh, believe that there is a so-called certain law of nature that stands uh, above common law, stands above 
uh, what they call you know, the circuit land, uh, circuit law that stands above uh, the common law, law of people. And that law cannot be changed. Um, in this paper, I, I argue that the idea that nature you know, is somehow a coherent essence uh, external to the realm of human beings has been but a recent uh, modern uh, imagination. In the course towards modernization, the making of the first nature has been an integral part of the process of nation building. So nation and nature you know, in, the case, in the context of Thailand cannot be uh, separately uh, understood. It is the nature as economic capital as much as a symbolic capital um, of the modern and civilized Thai nation state. So the discussion topic uh, in today will be divided into possibly uh, three, uh, three topics. So I, I would like to argue today that um, by tracing the process of by historicizing you know, nature, I argue that nature, you know, as perceived as an untouchable, self-regulating and dehumanized entity, uh, has been primarily a product of the constant say, state intervention. With forest and na uh, natural landscape since the colonial era in the early 20th century, and the, and the you know, later on the adoption of the North American wilderness thinking. Uh, by the modern Thai state in the uh, 1960s. But unlike the romantically conceived model of the North American National Park, the Thai imitation in its deployment of quote-unquote wilderness reversed its original. Contrary to the idea of the sacred law of nature that major, uh, major conservationists have often claimed, the protected areas in Thailand has never been free. And the process of capitalization of natural resource, you know, is a in a very important part of the making of the modern nature in Thailand. So I would like to start with the first. Uh, it's a first. I think I would I would say this kind of first process of making nature into resources. So in the pre-modern time, you have several terms that uh, define. Certain area we call Pa, right? Pa, Pa Dong, Thuan, Phong Prai, Wanna. There might be a few others. But all of these refer to you know, the un unpopulated, the raw, the disorderly realm of trees and animals. Right? Um, uh, it is an area that is considered, that was considered peripheral to the human, cultivated and organized Mung, and another term which is, you know, stand in opposition. Well, is a sphere of organized society. Um, Pai is the wide and barren area that needed to be remade into human habitation. And the state knowledge back at the time about this area was as scanty as that of its uh, inhabitants. In the Mang Rai law, written by King Mang Rai of Lana Kingdom, a uh, long time ago, like five, century ago, the, the people who offer their sweat and tears in quote unquote turning forests and areas and barren fields into orchards and towns, they, they would be exempt from levy or tax charge uh, from the product of the land for three years. And this was in order to ease the life of such devoted people. So the idea of placing people to clear the forest to make a land or entitled Kaklang Thang Pong as Good commoners remain very prevalent until uh, the mid 20th century. But Pa also reflects a deeper socio cultural uh, connotation than its usual Western translation of forest. In general sense, Pa means a forested area which is not well ordered. But however, it also connotes a mystic arena more powerful than human. The supernatural and spiritual territory which exists. Uh, beyond human control. And you can see this Hindu concept of uh, we call, you know, Himapan forest. Um, so this Himapan, some of you might know already, is like a place where you have uh, mystic animals uh, and, you know, uh, elements which are not human who reside in there. Um, so this doesn't mean that in Thai perception, human beings are totally disconnected from Pa. There was a special kind of human residing in 
uh, such as permits, who through their struggle against material and emotional temptations came to attend ultimate magic powder. But uh, also represents a peaceful sanctuary for Buddhist, Buddhist monks in pursuit of ascetic path. And also a shelter for escape and illicit uh, illicit for, uh, repository beyond the state control. So in this sense, by in a more pre-modern thinking of the Thai uh, uh, signified for the landscape of untamed peripheral periphery to the center of the state uh, power, as much as a, a sacred enchanted place made distant from human beings by the aura of fear, mysticism, and reverence. But, uh, however, at the turn of the 19th century, these ideas had changed. Colonial timber industry that expands from the Mon territory into the adjacent forest in northern Thailand has significantly changed the idea of Ba. The Royal Forestry Department, or RFD, was established in uh, 1896 after a survey of uh, teak forests in the north by a Danish man called Custom Jones and then uh, by an Englishman uh, called uh, Herbert Slade. So the first director of IFD, Slade, uh, resolved that forests in Thailand would now be considered as the quote-unquote country's capital, to which the benefits belong. So far, the wild and mystic land had become visible and vulnerable to the Mueang, the center of the country thanks to the German model of the scientific forestry followed by the British colonialism. So the term Pa forest was replaced by Pa Mai, forest wood, right? analogous to nature, to uh, nature resources. Um, it is a utilitarian discourse in which the forest is um, on those aspects uh, of nature can be appropriated for commercial use. With forestry science and its capacity to transform the real, disorderly, chaotic forest into rationally ordered uh, arrangement of trees, the state has been able to develop a new strategy of controlling forest. Now, the natural forest of Ba has thus been, been made into the administrative forest. So the establishment of IP was part of a modernization project and a means to reduce the British monopoly of tea business in the northern region. Ironic, ironically, such attempts were carried out with the assistance of the British colonials. So Thailand has never been colonized, everyone knows. But you look at the first, in, in almost all the uh, departments that uh, were established during that time, you have European uh, experts or European consultants you know, sit as the director general. Uh, good case is the Royal Forestry uh, Department. Um, so the it took for this uh, department it took I think almost three decades before this new institute would have its first Thai director general. So the first uh, the forest does enter the modern world of Siam in the form of a mere commodity, bereft of all its cultural and spiritual values. High quality sun mystique became the nation's most valuable export item, second only to rice. Uh, and I, show, I will show you this. So, this was uh, between 1904 to 1907. Right? So, you have this rice as a you know, first item that generated most of the national income. Tea came as the second. And back in the old time, Back in the old time, the main, the main uh, working force that were used in order to transport logs were elephants. And you have a lot of pictures of this you know, in the north. You know, um, that probably explains why elephants came to symbol, symbolize Chiang Mai. Because of his labor, you know, hard labor back in the colonial time. Um, so, uh, the equivalence of forest with teak forest or Ba Mai Sak was fundamental to the development of Siamese forestry in which the forest was managed on the basis of mono species. The center of um, logging activities 
including uh, the office of the RFD back in that time, was concentrated in the northern part of the country, the home of natural teak forest. The first railway uh, between Bangkok and Chiang Mai was completed in 1921 under British uh, supervision and foreign loans to facilitate transportation of teak from the north to Bangkok. So other railways to facilitate locking were also built by the European concessionaires across water chains to difficult terrain such as in Yong and Li river basins. The teak era under European colonialism ended after uh, World War II, as the concession period was over, with no further extension granted by the Thai government. However, the locking of non teak trees classified as Mai Gaya Lewe. And at first, when they first uh, came across this term, I thought it was a type of a tree. But no, it's a, it's a forester term to call any kind of tree, all kinds of tree, uh, except teak, Mai Gaya Lewe. So you know, it's a very interesting kind of classification. It's, it means miscellaneous food <coughs> excluding tea. So it was logged by the Thai companies after the British one, um, and it followed the, the early model. It, during the British time, you know, it was a selective locking. So you lock only trees, and you you spare some uh, certain area so that the tree you know would be regenerated. But later on, you know, Chinese and Thai companies uh, they use clear cut. Uh, clear cutting method in order to uh, reap the benefit out of the forest. Commercial locking continued to be predominant form of Thailand's forest ex exploitation until it was banned nationwide in 1989, following a massive local protest against clear felling of trees in the south that had caused huge mudslides, flooding, and severe damage to property and the deaths of hundreds of villagers. However, the productive function of the forest still persists but in other forms, such as tree plantations. So, okay, um, back in that time, elephants did all of these jobs because there were only two uh, ways of transporting logs from the north uh, to Bangkok. One is through river, from, you know, Big Wangyongdan to Javiya River, and the other method is through railways. So the uh, ball picture was built by I believe it's a Danish uh, company in uh, Ban Hong district, Nakhon province, in order to transport log out of the forest. Um, and you know the, the lower part, lower picture is uh, the train that's transported uh, logs. And this is a picture of the East Asiatic Company in Bangkok. Most of the timber office uh, and sawmill uh, were located near Javaya River back in that time. <laughs> Another picture of the Daily Mod and this kind of timber companies, British company. Okay, um, the other phase of uh, commercializing nature came with uh, came in the era of national park. So West, Western forestry practice has continued its influence despite the withdrawal of European timber companies in the mid 20th century. In Thailand, <coughs> as well as other third world countries, Western power remained in the form of advisory functions. So in 1948, the first group of forest experts from FAO, led by um, Jean Dan Hoff, a Dutch forester from Indonesia, came to Thailand to provide advice and assistance on natural resource management. The major problems of forestry in Thailand, as pointed out by the FAO, Food and Agricultural Organization team, um, were that uh, Thai state lack of knowledge, lack of technology, lack of uh, manpower and financial support for forest management. The report by this team pointed to the fact that the forest in Thailand was managed in a very unprofessional and inefficient way. And the problem of forest encroachment and poaching was caused by quote unquote chipping cultivation. It was FAO who recommended that uh, Thailand must have 40% of the total land area of the country preserved as protected area. Um, I have tried to find to, to find out why 40, but I could not. So if anyone in this, this room have you know a clue of why 40%, you know, please tell me. Because this figure has been a very kind of political figure in Thailand. Forester try to maintain that it must be 40%, you 
know, and that's a part of you know the reason why a lot of people were trying to uh, move, be moved out from the forest. So after the Danish uh, forester, you have another very influential person, George Rowe, an American National Park expert from the U.S. National Park Service, who did a survey in 1959 and a report in 1964 for IUCN as well as the American Committee for International Wildlife Protection, which became the basis from, for the establishment of park management in Thailand. So in this report, there were a lot of interesting statements. Um, and this one is probably uh, the one that point out the key ideas that the uh, American experts uh, see uh, how Thai for, you know, fate of Thai uh, forestry back in that time. And you can see the politics of lacking Right uh, in this statement, only few Thai people recognize that plants, animals were uh, precious back that time. And there was an another statement which I find very interesting too. That uh, Bloom said that Thai people see parks only from amusement, and none of the Thai you know understand the so-called uh, the aesthetic aspect of nature. So you need you know an expert in order to guide Thailand. Uh, towards a more developed or civilized idea of, uh, of nature and nature conservation. Western guidance coincided with the desire of a newly modernized state such as Thailand. So during the reign of Phil Marshall Summit between 1955 to 1963, <coughs> national parks as well as the monarchy and, Thai, and the Thai language <coughs> um, began to be seen as ideal national symbols. The establishment of a national park system, a landmark of modern Thai civilization, came to represent um, the key elements of the modern Thai nation state, while forest destruction was perceived as a criminal act to destroy the country. So it took up the new idea of national forest and politicized it, or you know, one, one could also say that militarized it. He stated, forests are significant natural resources for the lives of Thai people and the existence of Thailand. Those who destroy the forest are the enemy who destroy the national security. So it was the first time the forest you know, come to equate national security. So in this sense, a communist and a for and forest people, you know, now you know now occupy a similar vulnerable position back in that time. As a post-war product imported from the U.S., it came in as a development package offered by the American government. The U.S. not only provided advisory assistance on national park establishment, but also funded Thai government officials' trip to the Yellowstone, American first national park. This development assistance can be understood as an attempt to halt the so-called influence of communist Indochina. And economic development and natural resource management were a major aspect of the development model of the Thai government imported uh, from the U.S. So you have this technocrat, right, Forrester, back in, I think, 1959, 1960 or something, went to Yellowstone. Another book went to, to see Tennessee Valley Authority, you know, the dam. So dam and national park uh, came to represent the modern image of uh, a civilized country. Um, so we then have the first wildlife uh, conservation act in 1960, followed by national park act in 1962. Why do we have to have two acts? I try to ask forest, <laughs> some forest academy in Thailand uh, because the way that it manages, I think, probably different from the U.S. And they say that it's just politics. You know, there were too many forest authorities who want to, you know, go to be in a high ranking position and they have uh, some kind of conflict within the department. So they divided the section into two, national park and wildlife sanctuary uh, management. The first national park in Thailand was officially declared at Khao Yai in 1962, covering the areas um, of four provinces, followed by the first wildlife sanctuary, uh, Salak Pla, in 1965 in Gajanamuri. For Thailand, the, the American concept of national park has come to represent a means to enable the country to board the chief of Western civilization. As uh, Dr. Gun Sok Le Kakun, the 
people regard him as the father of modern conservation movement in Thailand. And he stated that the establishment of the wildlife conservation law and national park in Thailand has pointed out to the world that Thai people have moved beyond barbarism of people who are aware only food for stomach to the era of civilization, quote unquote. So, you know, it's time to uh, know food for eyes, for ears, and for the brain rather than just for food. But which group of people does these new forms of resource management refer to? The answer is clearly illustrated in this statement by a national park committee member and also a forest academic and the faculty of uh, forestry in the state side, university that I interviewed back in 1959. And he pointed out very clearly that um, national park you know, should be the kind of uh, area managed by what he called the core group of people that is educated. And he believed that um, urban people whose livelihood does not rely directly on the national park tend to be able to appreciate the beauty and aestheticism of national park more than village people. So the underlying assumption of such statement are twofold. First, the prerequisite to enter into the regime of national park is formal education. Without such modern orientation, the appreciation and understanding of the value of national park is deemed impossible. Second, the distance between nature and human beings presumes the neutral and disinterested position of people towards nature. Thus, the more intimate the relationship between human life and nature, the more untenable the newly distanced neutral relationship will be. Such assumption reveals a fundamental belief of scientific forestry which has continued its influence over Thai foresters since the 19th century. Here again, National park is a particular kind of object of knowledge, which can be acquired only through an institutionalized form of state education and state control. But this course of state education functions as a tool not only to undermine the pre-existing connect connection between local livelihood and forest, but also to provide legitimacy and justification to the outside urban middle class over local people in their relationship with this particular forest area. It is worth noting that the politic of nature um, aestheticism in Thailand is not exclusive. Um, Newman, who is a political ecologist, observed that in European history, the spatial separation which divides landscape or production from consumption is essential for the establishment of national parks. This process was advanced as a product of transition to industrial capitalism, in which nature appreciation had become the marker of education and good and good breeding of proper bourgeoisie. Urban middle class appreciation of, or consumption of nature takes the form of temporary observation, yet demands inclusive control over landscape, regardless of any necessary engagement in the sphere of production. Newman maintains that the duality of insider and outsider, or practical and aesthetic, is fundamental to the social construction of the sense of ownership and control over the landscape. Central to the problem is thus not whether local villagers are short in taste and appreciation of nature, but the fact that direct local reliance on forests also means direct access and control over national park resources, all of which must be dismantled if a new type of landscape, a new division of labor, and a new form of authority by the middle class are to be established. That is, a conservative landscape as separate from productive landscape, managed for recreation and contemplation. But if we take a closer look at um, the way park is managed, we come to see that it's not you know, as simple as uh, National, Park, National Park Authority uh, often claim. Uh, not every type of natural forest has come under the protected area system, nor have all diverse ecological system and distant, distinctive fauna and flora been granted equal status within the natural park system. The basis of selecting natural parks in Thailand comprises two components. First, outstanding natural elements, 
which is, you know, if you have makeup fauna and this thing which is characteristic, of course that will declare natural park, right? So you have you think about big elephants, tigers. Do you have light ones? <laughs> but you ha you happen to have like <clears throat> snakes, toads, frogs, unlikely to be declared as natural park. They're you know, poor, poor small animals. And second large areas with uh, then assign value and ranking. Some forests are given superior value, while some uh, ecosystems are completely set apart from protection. Thailand's 128 national parks and 57 wildlife sanctuary comprise mostly large mountainous forests, beaches, and islands, which are valued highly for tourism and the conservation of large mammals. Um, we can probably guess which kind of forest will be left out from this model. Uh, this is the uh, first national park in Thailand. Everyone knows about it, Khao Yai National Park. Well, of course, it must be in mangrove, poor mangrove, right? Um, even though wetland mangrove, despite its significant ecosystem, they have not been classified as national parks. This has been the case even after the government banned locking concessions and increased the number of national parks from 57 to 128. Um, the failing of mangrove forests for the charcoal industry was exempt from the locking ban. In addition, between 1970s and 1990s, nearly 200 hectares of mangroves have been destroyed to make way for a trim uh, farm. And one would ask why, right? Um, one academic forest, uh, forest academy explained that, oh, not this one, sorry. There might be two main reasons why wetland and lowland uh, riverine forest has been neglected by national park uh, technocrats. First, these areas are not large. Most of the mangroves area distributed in Thailand, you know, it distributed along the coast, um, are often viewed as trivial and unimportant. And second, most significantly is they are viewed as lacking the scenic value designed for tourism compared to the natural uh, dry lands forest. So practices of national park management in third world countries, including Thailand, therefore follow two principles of U.S. wilderness thinking, uh, the so-called the monumentalism belief that while wilderness has to be big, right? continuous wilderness, and the claim that all human intervention is bad for the retention of diversity. So natural, natural ecosystems are therefore viewed not as much as their ecological significance as in their construct, constructed aesthetic and thus economic value. Southern mangrove forests in their unfortunately unattractive outlook can only become productively valuable as a site for charcoal and chim farming, while their ecological value and function are ignored. So if hands off nature is believed to be one of the two principles underlying the conservation in Thailand and elsewhere, it is conditional and hypocritical. Originally, Thailand accepted the IUCN definition of polluted areas, which are, quote unquote, not materially altered by human exploitation and occupation, and where the highest competent, competent authority of the country has taken steps to prevent or eliminate as soon as possible the exploitation in the area. This definition in the case of Thailand is proven to be a myth. Since 1960, <clears throat> the Thai government has approved mining operations, the construction of dams and military security roads, as well as pharmaceutical research by private companies inside national parks and wildlife sanctuaries and watershed areas throughout the country. For instance, between 1970s and, and uh, 1990s, the construction of six large dams inundated more than 200,000 hectare forests, all within uh, areas classified as protected. Uh, one of these uh, included the Chiu Lan Dam, or Khen Orat Chapapa Dam in uh, Sulatani province, which flooded more than 16,000 hectare forest ecosystem with, within the Khao Sang Wildlife Sanctuary and Khao Sok National Park. 
destroying the habitat of 338 species of wildlife, 14 of which are endangered and uh, 32 threatened. And here's a picture of the legendary uh, Sir and the forester um, in his mission to rescue wildlife um, after the dam was built. Um, interestingly, in the eyes of the Thai state, as well as some forester, dams are considered to be a type of watershed conservation, necessary for the country's <coughs> resource management. They are not a destructive component, but instead an indispensable part of protected areas. And we can, uh, this is Chiu Lan then. We can look at this statement by uh, a senior forest academic. I think he's probably retired already. You know, we, people call him father of modern shade management. And he said very clearly that a dam and its reservoir is significant for storing water. But to ensure that the consist and he is a forester, don't confuse that he he's a an engineer, no. He's a forester. To ensure the consistency of water in the reservoir, we need to make sure that the watershed forest above the reservoir is well reserved. That's not, that is why the conservation watershed forest is significant. Indeed, the flooding of vast areas of forest destroying numerous habitats of, habitats of flora and fauna will soon be forgotten as the landscape will be turned into a magnificent reservoir furnished with a splendid modern infrastructure and facilities including resorts, golf course and reservoirs. With a little bit of investment, the reservoir will once again function as a tourist site to suit the aesthetic objectives of a national park as the area sunk below its waters will soon do. Here you go on the resource um, in this area. What we have here is twofold. On the one hand, the capitalization of nature, be it fake or not, um, goes hand in hand with the growing bourgeois community and its increasingly uh, intense lifestyle in big cities, which need a way to add new amenity and aesthetic goals and design to their earlier preoccupation with necessities and convenience. On the other hand, nature which is made to be fragile and susceptible also requires protection. And a powerful protection apparatus cannot be designed without the existence of a threat. Within uh, the history of forestry in Thailand, the politics of threat making has long been an intimate part of the protected area ideology. And certainly, the most perilous threat to the national forest repeatedly constructed and reproduced by the state. It's not dams, roads, forests, or other development interventions, but the so-called hill tribes and their agricultural activities. Hill people and their existence are always presented as dark side of certain nature. The assumption need not be professional. Once something has been defined as a threat, it is left no room for existence. And this can be epitomized in a statement by, you know, you can use a lot of statements. In this book, I use other statements. But this statement is more recent, just last year. But it's the same kind of message. Um, this is a statement by the Director General of the National Park uh, Department. In his defense of the burning of current houses by his park authority inside the Gajan National Park. And he claimed that, um, these are, you know, the current who illegally come to use the land outside of this uh, designated area. And it's a park official who, you know, went to explain and move them down. And the reason why they have to burn the houses is because to prevent the spreading of epidemic and malaria diseases carried, <laughs> carried out by the, the current people. And it was also to prevent the Burmese immigrants who illegally came to the area to grow marijuana. Um, okay, I'd like to conclude here. Now, what I have done in this talk is to bring into light the representational practices that we shape the multiple ways in which nature is known, used, abandoned, and protected. Nature as a political construct has, has never had its, its own law and has never, never been free. 
but oftentimes they may, um, mediated um, by the practice of intervention, which involves the very process of naturalization and normalization of knowledge, perception, and recognition. Yet, in spite of its fallacy, the prevailing idea of nature as untouched wilderness has managed to maintain its efficacy in guiding the way that protected areas in Thailand are administered and defined. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, do you have some questions? Any questions? conservation forest and 25% economic forest. The 10th and the most recent NESDP, which is as of date of the publication from 2007 to 2011, has maintained this 40% target uh, based on you know, the remote sensing uh, you know, sort of assessment. But then uh, following the sort of uh, devastating south of Thailand flood in 1988, yeah, uh, believed to be caused by the increase in deforestation, therefore the government imposed a logging ban in natural forests and reversed the ratio of conservation of eaten by forests to 25% and 15% respectively. Figures which remain current to this day, at least the data publication, which is about maybe 10 years ago. Does that help? Well, thank you. The figure switch back and forth all the time. Um, sometimes it's 40, sometimes they set up as 50. Mm -hmm. An interesting uh, switching is sometimes it's 20 and 20 protected areas and productive areas. Sometimes it's uh, 25, 15, as you mentioned. Sometimes switch back 15 and 25. But no, what I, what I wanted to know was the biological, ecological explanation of this figure. But I couldn't find any clue from uh, the explanation of the forest, forest green authority. What is the kind of, you know, ecological uh, basis of this figure? Some, some explain that it might have to do with, um, you know, the ability of forests to absorb carbon sink. But I have a feeling this idea might came later. I mean, might came, you know, after this figure was already set. I'm not sure. Uh, because this, um, as, you, as this uh, document has stated, and as, as we have also pointed out, that uh, the forest bank of 1988, uh, because of the flooding in the south, uh, and we have just uh, recently another flooding, <laughs> big catastrophic flooding in the south. So. In your view, what, is the what, what should be the explanation now? Is it because there's still deforestation going on, and therefore we should maybe even be more stricter in our uh, some way, or law enforcement or whatever? Uh, why is this still happening? Or is it due to other uh, reasons of climate change or whatever? Uh, in other words, what, 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 would be, what should be the view, or what should be the assessment now? 
now that we have another deterrence of the flooding, just like in the day, or maybe even more severe. So what, what could be the possible explanation now, or what, what should be the measures that need to be taken to, to avoid repeating such, I hope, <laughs> I wonder whether you have uh, investigated the role of the Royal projects in forest protection because in the last maybe five or six decades, Royal projects has been a core agency that uh, coordinates with other major agencies such as um, uh, the Forest Department or even the Armed Forces and we have seen the role of the Armed Forces very active in forest uh, protection in, say, at least in the last two decades. If you look at the, uh, the, the plan, the blueprint of the, of the army in these uh, last 10 years, it has included the forest protection into its uh, main duty as a part of the national security. That's my question. Uh, yes, in, in, in this book, there's a brief talk about um, several agencies and Royal Project is part of the very active uh, elements or active actors in uh, nature cons cons conservation too. But um, I think the approach that Royal Project um, has taken uh, compared to National Park uh, Authority, it might, it might be a little bit more complex. Because in the north, you have this uh, royal project that work uh, with uh, certain groups of hill tribes. And some, uh, some of the tribes can lay claim on this authority in order to uh, you know, continue to live in the forest, such as the Hmong. So in the area where royal projects were operating and you know, um, persuading people from Sweden of shifting cultivation to a more permanent kind of agriculture, like uh, planting cabbage or uh, carrots, right, and sell, sell into uh, the royal, royal project um, business, then those people will be able to continue to live in the area. National Park doesn't have agriculture extension um, project. So the, the approach that National Park Authority used, along with the military, uh, is more or less coercive. Resettlement is the only solution. Um, unless you have um, a kind, a more kind of, you know, uh, flexible national park uh, chief, uh, look at the national park, for instance, for instance. Um, different chief or different uh, head of the national park can mean different kind of policies. In certain period, where you, when you have a more flexible, then, you know, um, they would come up with eco tourism and work with local people to, to uh, reduce the area of uh, agriculture and turn it into uh, you know, kind of tourist-oriented activities. But in the time when you have the chief who is more militant, militant then you know, resettlement will be the only, uh, only uh, solution. Loyal projects itself, yeah, that's, there are different kinds of loyal projects. You have Kongkan Lo and you have Kongkan Palajatamri. Kongkan Luong and Kongkan Rajanuti work differently. Kongkan Luong is more kind of agricultural based project that aims to reduce uh, you know, the area of, of so-called traditional agriculture believed to destroy forest you know, into a more kind of uh, permanent vegetable base and to replace uh, uh, opium with marketable kind of products. But the Kongkan Palacham Damri, which I believe um, came from the Queen, that takes other that, that takes you know kind of different approach. So this needs to be, I think, you know, looked into in a in a in a more kind of com complex way, or like differentiated between you know different kinds of, of, of activities. What's your answer? <laughs> your question or not? But it takes more and more militant um, approach uh, lately 
National parks become more and more militarized and work more closely with the military. This I have not really looked into it. National park and wildlife sanctuary, uh, interestingly, wildlife sanctuary has more strict, strict uh, law. While national parks are kind of more open to tourists, urban middle class. But if you look at the approach that they use, you see the national park tend to use military oriented approach. They are more coercive than the wildlife sanctuary, which the authority there tend to um, be kind of research, like uh, forester. So this, this um, why um, such differentiation or the difference between their, their, their styles you know, take place, I, I'm not sure. But this was kind of a topic that need to, to, to look into. I don't have the answer either, but I just wonder when I look at the documents about all this thing, there seem to be a number of projects that overlap with. But I don't know how, how it's, it came out to, uh, to be what we have seen, what the, uh, the Huntas have done to the forest in the last two years, that they force evacuated people out of the forest. But I think when we look at the role of the uh, the armed force in the forest protection. They all has been involved in this uh, so-called water management, which is headed by the Royal Projects, right? uh, land management, uh, natural, uh, uh, the preventing of the deforestation, kind of thing. And so they have been involved in these several uh, projects involving natural uh, management, but just not sure how, how. We, we know that, for example, uh, the approach by like, uh, providing water to uh, uh, to the peasant in the rural area has been one of the the main project of the of the king. But it also involved armed force extensively. But this project alone didn't. In, include the idea of forcing people out of the forest. But how come when uh, the military has been in power, they started we were creating people from out of the forest so immediately. Just three months, I think two or three months after they came to power, after the coup they have to plan which area people have to be moved out. So this means that they have been working on this issue for, for many years. That's why they, they have the idea and they came and they produced a group hint the right after the coup. In Italy, that will be, you know, a kind of a, a, an important issue because then we have to trace back to the project in the Northeast many years ago. Once the military got involved in forest uh, management, it's always coercive and militant. Kochagori, you know, the plantation project, this is not made you can say that it's a nature conservation but it's not a protected area. But once the military is at hand into the project, it's always involved resettlement. So yeah, so we have to probably trace back to the history of you know how military got involved in um, forestry management. It's it's not only recent, I I believe. You can trace, you know, further back to nineteen nineties period. In the Northeast, and that was a really big kind of incident where people came out and protest against the culture of God. Uh, it, it, it actually is a land allocation project. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Adam, for a very interesting presentation. Your observation that things are becoming more militarized makes me think of a conference that I went to last year, a political ecology conference on political ecology conservation. And they were talking about conservation areas in Africa are also becoming far more militarized. And I, I think the question I want to ask you is, do you see, compared to your past analysis, new forms of securitization coming to justify militarization? So like the, the explanation that was said in Africa is that now there's a war on poaching. And the war on poaching as people become more armed as poachers requires an escalation of the militarization of, to protect the wildlife in this case. I wonder if you, if you think about the politics of conservation in Thailand, are there new narratives, maybe climate security, water security, drought security? 
wildlife security. But again, Kazan cares is, you know, um, it's totally fabrication. So when you, when you, you can you can you can probably um, say that it's uh, a new threat, like in a statement that the, the director of National Park Department uh, used there, is the kind of influx of um, migrants from from neighboring countries, right? But this is like you know fabricating a uh, statement. <clears throat> Um, immigrants from Myanmar did not came, did not come in that particular border area. You know, there are certain rules that people come to work. You know, who's gonna come into the forest and then, you know, poach and then hunt animals and then go back? No way. So this is just you know total, totally a kind of uh, the way in which um, the forest authority um, make justification of the violence that they that they uh, uh, use against the people. I would say that, um, you know, Ajahn Ajahn Pong Tong just mentioned that, you know, the the who they who they did provide justification for the park people to use violence um, because violence, you know, against people to many kinds of projects were licensed by the government. This kind of act would not be able to happen. Um, Let's say ten years ago, you know, how come you go and burn down people's houses and property? You took the case into court, and the court said that the park authority did no wrong. It's part of you know the the, the forest management system. No way, this will not be able to to happen. You know, when you have democracy, but once you don't have democracy, then you allow the already militant group of people, authority, you know, to to enforce. Um, the means in which, um, in normal situation, they, they will not be able to do so. So I would say that it's not a kind of threat that the new situation, the only thing new in Thailand is coup <laughs> d'etat. Damn democratic um, politics that we have. Um, but the threat, I, I don't think so. They have, the people have lived, lived there for decades, not for centuries, right? And they have long had the problem with national park. Um, the conflict has already been there many, many years ago, but it's just now that you know they they did this kind of action, violent action against them. Thank you so much for your interesting uh, presentation. Uh, your talk uh, intrigues the idea of relationship between national security and the establishment of national park. I I wonder if you can give us a little more details on the historical moments in the context of communist invasion in Thailand at that time because from the talk the US has great influence, huge influence on Thailand's protocol on national park operations. So do you have any information on that? For example, the order of national parks, which one should be the first priority to become national park at a time to against communist movement? Khaoyai National Park, after it was uh, demarcated uh, back in that time, you probably have to ask why Khaoyai. Uh, it's not just because well, the, the large area with big herds of elephants, um, of course, are major components. But in that area, um, in the northeast, was also you know the stronghold of Communist Party of Thailand. So after the declaration of Khao Yai National Park, the other thing that Sarit did was to build a road, a so-called friendship road in front of the middle park, right? cut through uh, the forest. Um, if I remember correctly, it was named not sure, I have to check so it road or something before it changed into, friend, into a friendship road. So American government funded that project. Communists live in the forest, so it's quite, uh, you know, it's one of the, the strategy uh, to suppress the communist insurgency, declare, you know, the boundary of national park, allow parks to patrol the area, cut the road into the area. So it came into, into the, the package. Then construction is also interesting. Um, 
the dam building. Um, if you if you take national park is a way in which the military government led by Solid, right, used in order to declare to the world that now we are civilized and modern. At the same time, it's a military strategy, right, uh, to combat communist insurgency to live in the forest. Dam function differently, right. If you have them, they believe that you provide water and electricity to rural population. If rural people are not poor, then they will not be brainwashed and persuaded by the communists. So this package of development, you know, joined hand in hand back in that time, funded by uh, the U.S. for sure. Because the first dam in Thailand was funded by U.S. Bank, uh, World Bank. I have two, two questions for you, uh, which are uh, informed by my experiments in Cambodia as an anthropologist. So in, in one way, in, in some ways, not in all ways, but in some ways, you know, Cambodia is now experiencing what has been experienced by uh, Thailand uh, 30 or 40 years ago. So it's nice to be able to, uh, to compare. The first question is that uh, you mentioned that uh, in the history of the uh, invention of these uh, uh, new perceptions of uh, forest, uh, the uh, conflicting views were more between the uh, urban uh, Thai educated people, uh, which uh, liked the forest and wanted the, the forest to be. Uh, from, uh, they wanted uh, some form of uh, conservation of the forest, and the neighbors, the peasants, uh, who lived uh, nearby the forest, and who were more, of course, uh, uh, having their living uh, uh, from the forest product. But what about uh, the uh, third element in this uh, conflicting uh, views, which would be the uh, uh, the uh, big uh, agroforestry companies? Was there any? Uh, I mean, uh, any conflicts with them? You know, it's a very big part now of the conflict of uh, the conservation of the forest in Cambodia. I mean, the big conflicts are uh, between, uh, and it, it's also a very politicized uh, conflict now in Cambodia, the question, the issue of the conservation of the forest. And uh, the activists are uh, more fighting against the big agroforestry than. Uh, while the government is more uh, eager to uh, uh, try to uh, avoid the uh, small scale uh, uh, loggers, local loggers, to. Uh, to uh, so, I mean, what about this third element? And the second question is about the. Um, uh, this aesthetic form, you know, the, 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 this invention of the forest as an aesthetic, uh, aesthetic element of the, of the nation. So I wondered if there was also a, a ritual element in this, uh, in this perception of the forest. Uh, you know, in Cambodia, uh, many uh, Cambodian people, even in the rural areas, think that the destruction of the forest is really associated with a, uh, a lack of potency of the country. And the, the word used, I think it's also used in uh, Thai, in Thai, it's parami, baromai in Thai, but parami is the Ali word that you, you know. So uh, the destruction of the forest is really believed to uh, uh, be responsible for lack of parami over the country, the whole, uh, the, the Cambodia as a whole. So I wondered if there was this kind of uh, ritual uh, aspect of the destruction of the forest also. That's all. Thanks. Okay, thank you for the very interesting question. The second question is hard. Um, I have to uh, think a bit, uh, to read a little bit. Um, conflict with Lucky Company, yes, it was a very, very vast um, um, incident back in the 80s when I, when I was still working with an NGO in the north. I was part of the, you know, the, the, the NGO worker who went up to the 
village um, because they asked me to help bridging uh, you know, the news to media, helping them to voice uh, the problem. So very, very kind of violent confrontation between logging companies and local villagers. Um, in the north, there were like 10, 11 places, you know, um, of uh, local villagers who protested against the clear cutting. Logging, actually, back that time, there was a law that prohibited logging in the watershed area or you know, in a you know, very small, um, smoky area and all that. But during the very last period of logging era in Thailand, uh, the Thai company just locked everything and it caused a lot of ecological destruction to you know, local uh, landscape. You know, they could not farm when you have much light you know, right in, in the paddies and in the Sweden um, But after that, we no longer have that confrontation. The confrontation moved elsewhere because Thai logging company moved to Burang, moved to Lao, perhaps moved to Cambodia too. I think that the, the situation uh, changed um, a bit because, as I you know, mentioned a little bit in this uh, discussion, that a productive forest still continue, but in, in a form of tree plantation. So you have these companies who came to plant eucalyptus trees everywhere in the northeast back in that time. And the case that I just mentioned to Ajahn Phuong Thong, you know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, that was a con uh, confrontation between this company who tried to take the land of the people and plant eucalyptus backed by the, uh, the military government. So that was a kind of big uh, conflict that local people, hundreds of them came out and marched, you know, tried to march to Bangkok to voice uh, the, their, their problem. Uh, excuse me, you mentioned only a conflict with the villagers, but is it a kind of is there any kind of politicization of this conflict? I mean, with activists, eco political uh, ecologists, uh, activists uh, involved in those kind of conflict, or just the villagers and the big uh, forestry companies? Oh yes, there are environmental groups that, that help help um, spreading the news or you know writing articles and the, you know trying to strengthen the movement of the local people back that time. In, in the 90s, the conflict was very much about the issue of uh, whether people can live inside protected area. So that you have, as I you know, said earlier in the beginning, nature conservation is kind of pure nature on, on the one end and on the other end. You have those people who believe that in tropical forests you can have non-human forests too. I'm not sure in the West. In the West, you have vast area forest in America. You walk like weeks and you never see anyone. That type of model, you know, if, if you want to create that kind of area in, in third world countries, people will die. But foresters, for somehow, and all these uh, foresters I interviewed, they all graduated from, the majority back in the 60s, graduated from University of Washington. And I interviewed three of them um, because I also graduated from that university. So I used this kind of linkage to interview them. But in the forestry department back in University of Washington, they changed their curriculum on it already. But in the Kaseza University, it's still the same. They still you know, use the same textbooks, teaching forest um, students, probably to arrest people, I'm not sure. But you know, the idea is still that you know, um, project area should be a kind of primordial area where uh, local people should not be resided. Second question, I'm not sure. Forest as a biology. Forest, I think, uh, in the pre-modern time, some, it's something that James Scott, you know, in his book mentioned, right? It's a, it's a, it's an area outside the polity, outside the moon where different kind of power exists. The king could not reach a forest in the old time. It doesn't mean that well, it has certain kind of power, but it's power which is constructed outside the realm of the, the center. So you have this mystic, mystic um, if someone wants to acquire that kind of supernatural power, then you go to the forest. So I, I would say, by me, it's more or less center-based, I would say, right? 
No, yeah, I, I think that para, para me doesn't have the same. You're right. Uh, doesn't have. It's more related to to, to, to uh, poverty in Thailand, but it has more uh, a wide meaning in Cambodia. It also it, it, it also it's also related to a uh, wide potency. So let's say potency rather than para, para me. You're right. Yeah. So what what kind of potency is associated with this uh, with this uh, forest? In uh, Thailand, is there any is there any idea that, uh, like in Cambodia, like for most Cambodians, that uh, those forests, uh, it's the same word. Huh? You will say pa. This is prey in Khmer. I think it's the same word. Pa. How do you call it? Pa. 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 This is a kind of uh, reservoir of uh, uh, potency for the whole nation, for the whole country. And if you cut all the trees, if you lock the trees, you know this potency, which in one way uh, protects all Cambodians, will uh, be uh, weaker and weaker. And this is a very strong belief uh, indeed. So it's a kind of it's a forest, not a tree, that symbolizes this kind. Yeah, of but thing. each each tree is potentially uh, potent, you know, some kind some kind of trees at least. Interesting. I'm not really sure. It's in well, I'm I'm not a historian, but it, this is an interesting uh, question to to look into. But I have a feeling that in a pre-modern forest in in Thailand is is a place where, as I said, hermits. Live rebellious group, um, millenary mil movement of people against the central government, the Sami's quality, um, certain sect of the forest monks is there, but this forest forest monks um, in Thailand is more kind of marginal. It's um, I try to think if there is a link between pre-modern polity and pre-modern forest. I'm not really, not very sure. But whether you have more has it. So is it powerful to use in order to uh, struggle against the blocking? So I mean, this kind of idea is still powerful in order to, to counter uh, the influence of blocking, commercial blocking. Can I quickly jump into the, the previous question about Barame. Um, according to the spread mediumship in Cambodia, they also call the practitioners Barame as well. So I guess that the keyword Barame compasses or covers the idea of potency, spirituality, or power in, in general sense. But I, I wonder about Barame as the potency of the nation in Cambodian context might just recently constructed after the, 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 the emergence of nationalism. Okay. No, well, it, it's, a, it's a big question and we, we could speak many, many, a very long time about uh, potency as uh, translated by Barame uh, in, in Khmer, but uh, uh, well, it's not just a question of, the, of a nation. You, of course, you know the, 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 the very idea of, na of nation is, uh, has uh, been constructed at the same date as in Thailand with Mahaksa and, and so on. But uh, it's not only a question of uh, uh, seeing uh, Cambodian that does not do, do not only think about they, they sell collectively as a nation. It's also uh, kindness, you know. Uh, it's many other perception of uh, the collective body uh, can be described through the uh, potency, uh, potency uh, uh, notion. It's not just just related to the, to the not, not just to the nation. Also, you know, the village has its its own potency, you know. Some uh, special people, uh, monks uh, living in the forest, and so on. So it's a very complex notion. Thanks. Um, thanks for the really interesting talk. Um, I think just to clarify 
what it seems to me the, the kind of thing that you're already engaging with here is about sort of local or indigenous access to forests, um, and kind of like the, an analysis of the background as to why their access and their use of these forests is being restricted. Um, and I was kind of thinking when you, when you finished the presentation that it's fascinating the kind of history, the colonial history, the political economy of it, um, the, the kind of impact of the industrialization, the securitization, militarization of these forests. Um, but what I was really wondering is like, what, what's the argument here? Is, it, is this just an analysis of the current kind of state of play here? Or are you using this analysis of the different factors that have led to the way that the, that have contributed to the way that resources are currently managed and access to these resources is currently managed to lead into some kind of some form of critique. So the question is that I have is like do you use this analysis to criticize the current use and current management of the resources? So for example by saying that um, by taking a political economy perspective the capital accumulation is an overriding factor that influences current management. Uh, or is it a sort of post-colonial criticism that uh, the way that the resources are currently uh, managed is, is an effect of uh, a kind of a colonial history that isn't admitted? Um, are, you talking, are, you, are you kind of criticizing it in terms of militarization, so it's an effect of the Cold War? Um, I'm just wondering, yeah, so what's the relationship between your analysis here and a criticism of the way that resources are currently managed? Well, this book actually, um, as I said earlier, it was part of my dissertation. And back in that time, you know, in the north, um, it was a high time of the the conflict between the two camps, right? And of course, this book, um, it is a political project for sure. It came out um, as a product of a way in which I wanted to historicize and politicize the so-called nature, because foresters and and uh, nature conservationists often claim that nature is something that has existed in Thailand long before local people came um, into the forest. Right? Um, in one of the conversation that I went to, uh, NGOs and local people tried to put, uh, put forward uh, the bill, community forest bill. The community should have the right to manage the forest even though they live within the project area. One nature conservationist said that, um, well, if we allow local people to live in there, then there will be no mushroom because people collected mushroom. Um, every single mushroom in the forest. And she asked um, if it's possible that um, the collecting of mushroom would be done at the, at the latter age, I mean, when the mushroom is old and the spore was there so that it can spread. Um, <laughs> so if um, if you if you allow that uh, stage um, of mushroom to to <laughs> well, you get into that stage, right? The mushroom will be not delicious for sure. Yeah? None of the villagers will buy into that idea. So my work is, of course, is a post uh, structuralist kind of um, approach, right? In order to go against biological uh, uh, ground that nature can be treated as as if it exists, you know, in an area where none of social scientists can do anything. But I, I would say that you know, there's no such uh, moment that nature is allowed to exercise or enjoy that kind of, um, of experience. And um, it's also a political economic uh, approach that asks the question who has the, the why to define nature as such? Who has, such, who has you know, the, the privilege? Right, to define nature and define it as you know a kind of uh, prominent, uh, predominant um, ideology that come to occupy the mindset of all the bourgeoisies and the forest authority in Thailand, and how come that the local ideas of nature is not granted uh, the official uh, recognition? So part of the book also trying to look at how current people perceive nature differently from the middle class um, nature conservationists who. Uh, graduated from the West. <laughs> so I'm, I'm not trying to sort of dichotomize it, but in a way, it's, it, it's, I think the politics of that dichotomy um, has been made by this powerful group of people in order to, to, to make a powerful claim. So that's all.
Yeah, and I, I think you did a really good job at that. And I, and I think the, the question that I'm asking uh, sort of comes from um, the assumption that you've done, you've done a very good job at that. You've politicized this, this kind of this management. Um, and, and you've kind of sort of opened, opened this up. But when you're, when you're talking about things like political economy, or if you're talking about securitization of this, it almost seem, it seems to me like you want to go one step further uh, to kind of criticize that as a way of managing the businesses. And I think in terms of the investment that you've got with the Hill people and with the, with the case that you showed on the screen earlier on, it shows another kind of investment there that you want to be able to kind of criticize that and go almost a step beyond that politicization of the, uh, of the management of it in, in, in order to uh, directly criticize and say this is this is an extension of, let's say, uh, this is a um, this is an application of a colonial form of knowledge and internal and colonization of Thailand's natural resources uh, and the relationship to, to kind of local and indigenous persons. So I'm just, I don't know, I guess I'm trying to encourage either, either to suggest that, that that criticism, I don't know, to ask if that criticism is something that comes out elsewhere, or if not, to suggest that it might be something that would be worth doing. Part of my hope is this book is um, to be read by forest uh, students, forest street students, so that you know the curriculum that they have in school can also uh, be expanded to cover um, the horizon of social science. Forestry cannot be a science, just pure science, because forestry in tropical area like Thailand is always you know uh, being an integral part of the local community. So if, if you don't have this, first of all, the historical aspect of how forests come into being, the second of all, you know, uh, the different kinds of ideas that come into play to construct this kind of knowledge, then it will we'll always, be, always be very you know, singular you know, and relating to other groups of people. So in, at the level of knowledge, I think this book, on, you know, part of my work, trying to create a dialogue it is a criticism, that is a criticism. It's a di I, I hope for the dialogue that Forester Authority would be able to you know, open up their, their, their mind to understand other uh, uh, point of view. Um, the alternative, yes, of course, um, after I, I, I graduated um, from the university, I also you know, took part in a project to study student agriculture in the north. And we work with progressive forest academy try to understand Sweden agriculture outside the box of you know, the forest uh, destruction model often propagated by the, the Forest Academy. So that's part of a very, very interesting project because we have, back at that time, uh, good young forest academics who work side by side with um, social scientists. And I also uh, made use of the report when there was a case like this and uh, the lawyer asked me uh, to be a witness in the court uh, hearing, so I went and you know along with the research, and at the I think the first hearing, the judge, um, um, I think the the decision came out in favor of the people, and I was very really happy. But the second second hearing was negative, so it's a long way to go in in you know trying to turn academic product into something that can help, can be helpful and useful. Oh, I have a uh, thank you Michael, for your presentation, very interesting presentation. Uh, I have a question about the evolution of the movement, the Pachun Chon uh, movement for the recognition of the forestry bill. And I would, well, it was uh, quite strong uh, 15 years ago, and um, it was also uh, accompanied by a transformation of the vision of the Karen people as a uh, protectors uh, of the forest, um, also um, the, the growing of uh, the hybridation of knowledge from science, scientific knowledge to, um, um, well, what we could say local practice, uh, indigenous local practice. And um, there was uh, quite, um, they were quite uh, meditized, um, you could see many uh, 
uh, well, sometimes in newspapers, articles talking about local knowledge and Pachuncha movement. And now it seems to be that you don't <laughs> hear not more about this and the voice of the people of uh, uh, um, mountainers uh, um, is not, uh, we, can, we cannot hear it anymore. So what happened? Because during these uh, 15 years and uh, what about this movement? Is, is it totally dead or is there something which is uh, continuing? I think the, the watershed of this movement um, was in 1995, I'm not sure, five, six, no. The, yeah, in the latter part of uh, the 20th century, when there were three drafts, three versions of the draft bill. One was proposed by the NGO and local movement. The, the second is from the Royal Forestry Department, and I don't remember the third version. But the difference is, local version try to propose that uh, community forest should be in the place where people live, no matter it is a protected area or is a reserve or you know productive forest. The RFD's version only allow. Uh, community forest to take place within the productive forest we call reserve forest not national park not wildlife sanctuary and when the bill uh, was uh, in the, the hearing uh, I think the Senate voted against the people's version so say, uh, senators um, came mostly from you know upper middle class group of Thai people who still believe that you know um, local religion should not be anywhere near the national park. So it, this is my personal take of the, the movement. Um, it ended with not a very positive result. I say it's a failure. But as you might see that you know it's part of the, the victory. At least you you put you 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 were able to you know put this bill into the parliament. But it did not grant you know, the full right to people. So now you have this local communities who live in a reserve forest, they're okay, they can work side by side with the forester. But in a case like the, you know, the current people in the Gangajan National Park, you know, you live in a very, very, very vulnerable uh, condition. When forester can come knock on your door and, you know, set fire to your house and, you know, uh, kick you out. After that, uh, that bill, was passed and then it was not in favor of the local uh, communities and community right activists. I think the, the, the movement tend to sort of die down in, in a way. And some means you move to that in the direction that they, okay now we work with the forest authority try to set up the local level kind of regulation how people would use timbers, how people would use um, you know forest product things, things like that. But in terms of the grand movement there's no further kind of you know continuity unfortunately. And nowadays, I don't think that we can hope for any kind of movement in the, in the current political situation. It's really difficult. Yeah, I would like uh, to, to ask you about uh, another topic that you um, uh, that you treated at the square. That was, was not so good question today about this. It was about tourism and uh, most of the middle class tourism, what we call maybe Tio Tamashat in in the Utayan um, Chat. If we speak about what uh, kind of source, what what is the sign of what Utayan or the National parks are the sign of uh, how do they relate to um, to the nation in Thailand. What would you say about the circulation of tourists in, uh, in the national parks? And uh, there is one reductionist way of seeing things that okay, people go there to have lunch and take selfies, and there. <laughs> Yeah, that's it. <laughs> then it's very poor. Uh, 
And if you look at the, at the, the whole phenomenon and how it develops very rapidly, actually, uh, what do you think the, 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 the natural spaces that are compounding uh, national parks are the source of what people can grasp there that they cannot grasp? And does it have something to do with uh, some kind of definition of what would be to be Thai and to be part of something which would be the Thai nature or a Thai culture? Or are the border there quite blurred, actually? And why, the, if the borders are, are blurred and then blurred, why should it be more interesting to invest in Utayang, in uh, national parks? than in other, in other places, which are most obviously uh, some kind of um, source for economic resource, like uh, any exploited uh, part of the land. Um, well, thank you. It's a very interesting question. I, I cannot do a research, which is a very good topic too, um, on the tourist culture, Thai tourist culture. Um, but you know, as I said in, in this presentation, that even though Thai uh, authority, Thai government imitate or borrow the idea of national park or the idea of wilderness from the West, um, it reverses its, its original meaning. It makes it into a kind of the the continuity of um, the nature as an element that can be capitalized. So. In the, in the first period, you have this kind of, uh, in Escobar's term, uh, first nature where you can can reap the benefit directly from timber extraction, right? But second nature, um, in, instead of, you know, uh, producing uh, the benefits directly from the nature, you have this kind of consumptive, uh, uh, consumptive means, right, to reap benefit out of it. So, Thai people who go into National park to forest. Um, we borrow the idea of national park from the West, where we don't, we didn't borrow the culture of you know how to be in the, in the national park. So exactly what you said, right? You, know, you when you go into the park, you see this uh, groups of people come with a guitar or maybe two guitars, and you know um, a lunch mat, and you know sit at the waterfront and you know have this kind of group chorus or something. They don't. They don't sit there quietly, um, you know, enjoying the kind of spiritual connection with uh, with the forest. No, they went there to consume. So it's part of the leisure time when you go and you you know you consume certain kind of commodity. So national parks part of the commodity. And interestingly, you have to look into what park authority provides too. Right? They provide food in the restaurant. You have restaurant inside the national park, and you um, as rule. George Rue mentioned back in that time that you know, Thai people see parks as an amusement. Exactly. And Thai people continue to see parks as an amusement park. You know, it's not a national area where you wander around in order to understand yourself in relation with nature. No. No one goes into the park alone in Thailand. No. So unlike in North America when you go trekking or you camping, you know, with a few, you know, partner or friends or sometime alone. No. Parts uh, in Thailand, you have to go into as a group. The more, the more right? <laughs> the more, the, the more fun. The more numbers, the more fun. So it's um, it's become a kind of you know a con consumption area that cater to, as I said, you know the kind of intense urban bourgeois who during the weekday you know work um, hours, long hours, and then at the end you go there in order to you know, release your stress and tension. So that uh, that way, I don't see that uh, the creation of national park in Thailand, where tourists go to to you know take some rest and you know enjoy their their fun time there, is a break or a, a disruption uh, of the history of forestry. It's a continuity. First period, it functioned as productive, right? Direct extraction of the resources. Second nature, second period, you know, still is a kind of productive nature, but act or function in the consumption and of arena.
excuse me, just I, I'm really interested by this discussion. But I understand what you what you mean, but at the same time, people uh, make the choice to enjoy collectively with their parents and friends in the forest and not in other places. So why the forests or why the national parks and not other parts? Uh, they could just uh, stay at home and uh, meet their friends and parents, but they choose to go and have lunch in the forest. So they, they, it means that uh, it has a special meaning. It, even if it's just for entertainment. Um, I'm not sure if they just go there or they do it everywhere in Thai people. My point is that uh, if the park function right, as a leisure place for people where people sort of, you know, Im Im immerse your, themselves into the area with the things that they do outside the park, why other groups of people are excluded? Why local villagers who also, you know, um, practice their usual activities in the forest um, become illegal? When Thai people, Thai tourists, you know, do exactly as the so-called disturbance of nature, are considered something normal and, you know, um, allowed. I'm not saying that, you know, the way Thai people go to the national park is something wrong. It's a culture here, <laughs> even though I don't like it, but you know, it's been like this for a long time. My only point is, you know, how come bourgeois people can do it and local villagers cannot? How come local people, when you know, they go, Thai tourists, you know, they go there and collect, collect everything in the national park, you know, <laughs> small animal butterflies, things like that. How come local villagers do the same thing and they are, you know, illegalized? Oh, um, just a, it's a, just a remark about this, but I, I saw in Thailand a big interest uh, to uh, watersheds, uh, landscapes, and I see maybe they have a special um, uh, place within this uh, aesthetical uh, conception of the of na what is nature, in fact, because um, you said that they go to a farm. Thai people go to to see nature, to see nature, but they don't go really into nature. What is well the place which are considered that the, the more um, aesthetical or interesting for um, Thai or they go to temple, temple to find solitude and you know oneself. If they go alone, then they go to meditate in the temple. The park is something that provides, you know, something else, a collective kind of fun. <laughs> um, I think, speaking of Thai tourism, uh, I think as I began, my answer the question, like maybe partially, not tentatively, by talking about the gender or feminization of a forest, um, the article you <laughs> so that might answer why the Thai tourists uh, went to the, the forest and doing some kind of, I don't know, pretty masculine activity. Mm. Yeah, you might elaborate on that point. Gender? What's yeah, I mean, the, the, the gender, I would say, the feminization of a forest mm. and 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 how the Thai um, consume the forest racially. Thai males, uh, when they, the quote that I put up uh, by Bun Song, Le Kapun, uh, it has a, a, an interesting um, uh, background. Bun Song, who is considered as father of the wilderness movement, used to be hunters, uh, wildlife hunters. So he hunted a lot. He's a doctor, a physical doctor. Later on, you know, quit uh, hunting. So um, hunting animals, I think the same, probably same thing in a ways, right? You males go in, into the forest to hunt in order to to grow up, right? to become um, a full 
men. So a lot of males go into the forest in order to uh, to prove that you know I'm no longer a young youngster, but I'm you know a mature male. Is that what you you, you want them to hear? Female, I mean women. Women go into the forest. Um, middle class women go into the forest. I I don't I don't think that the pattern of uh, traveling into the forest between males and females are the same in Thai culture. Males, a lot of males. There might, there, there might be some group of, of men like to trek in the forest, but trekking um, provide them with the masculine identity that they um, can acquire now that no one um, is ordained anymore. So forests function that way, that you know, you grow up while you trek, you see big animals and you adventure things um, inside the forest. Um, Women probably teen, teen and females go in a group as as you know um, the colleague here said you know go in a group and then swim in the water in the waterfalls and eat chit chat sing songs things like that so it's a different kind of function. You know, I I mean how how you did uh, I would say uh, nature as woman and how the masculinity kind of um, I don't know, treat nature um, in, as, as, as women that out of the for the talk. I was just wondering because uh, this issue of nature and conservation of forests it has taken place in many different countries. So like uh, you know, Tanyani has written about this in Indonesia and I'm sure there are examples in Nepal and India and so on and so forth in Asia. So uh, I just wanted to hear from you what you think are the key distinctive um, um, ways in which uh, this politics of nature has been played out in Thailand. Yeah. yeah, so I mean, compared with other countries where they've um, also had this idea of you know, the Western concept of trying to conserve nature, how is it, what do you think is distinctive about the Thai case as compared to these other cases? Oh, interesting question. Um, I didn't do much of a comparative study, but I read some of the articles. And I, 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 said, as I said earlier that um, it's interesting that the idea was from the other side of the world, and the other side of the world already changed, but here it did not move anywhere. Right? Um, the question is whether other countries, you know, move somewhere else or you know change the ideas or not. Um, Indonesia, I'm not sure who came from Indonesia here or have some background there. Indonesia have different kind of um, customary customary law, right? Um, and customary law, fortunately, was recognized by the government. We have ADA. And you have certain area called indigenous area where at least that type of traditional law can function. Uh, other countries here probably the same. I mean, look at the, the macro region here: um, Cambodia, Laos, Vietnam. Probably the same. The same model that uh, is part uh, without people. Uh, it depends on how. Uh, the internal factor is, you know, how the customary um, regulation, a local law, uh, is strong enough to maybe counter or work together with the law imposed uh, from the outside. But you look at Indian Nepal uh, cases, different. Over there, they already have a joint management uh, forestry model, right? Thailand, Thai forestry try to do that in order to get funding. But they do it, you know, in, in the way that they prefer, I mean, the forestry authority prefer, right? In the area where they want to plant trees or in a degraded forest area. They don't do it in the present area. So if you want, want a comparison, I would say it's probably the same, the same, the same kind of situation. In Laos, situation might be worse. Because resettlement can happen, you know, without, sometimes without compensation. And in the name of development too. 
it doesn't matter, you know, if it's uh, in the national park or wildlife sanctuary. Same thing, they can build dams, they can build roads inside of that. been any like objective comparative assessment let's say between state managed conservation efforts versus people management has there been any such kind of assessment in other words if you want to I mean the assumption is that uh, or like what you are saying and I think I intuitively kind of agree is that you know sometimes um, coexistence is not bad but is there any data or evidence to support that? Uh, there's already the data that indicates uh, national park uh, capacity, the capacity of national park uh, authority alone cannot manage the park throughout the country. That, that, that was already studied, I think, by the park itself. Uh, the budget has been you know, decreased over 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 time, and you look at um, uh, the problems uh, inside the park and wildlife sanctuary. You have probably five to ten people, uh, forester, you know, patrol around, patrolling around uh, the area, and that's not enough. The 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 legendary forester um, in the slide that I show, Kun Sir Nakasati, killed himself. Uh, ten something years ago, because of this problem, you know, we have my life poaching problem in this area. He asked for the budget and the manpower from the RFD, but you know there was no provision by the high-ranking authority. So he decided, you know, uh, one day that he cannot save the wildlife that he uh, uh, managed in his uh, wildlife sanctuary, Wake Can wildlife sanctuary. So he decided to kill himself. My point is. Um, <laughs> The co-management between local people and the park authority should be the, the solution to the problem here. And it benefits national park authority too. If you um, co-manage the area with the local people, the question is why, why, they, why didn't they choose that, uh, that alternative? So it's, more, it's a political issue. RECOP has done um, the that's a regional community forest something something organization has done a lot of work on this issue inside the political area. But I don't think that the um, authority in the Department of Forestry and National Park may now they separate the departments into two. You have Royal Forestry Department and National Park uh, Department. I don't think that the National Park Department buy into the idea. It's more. It's not a utilitarian kind of ground that they they don't buy into the idea. It's more kind of it's a mindset right, of the of the forester that you know uneducated people should not be should not be granted right to to, to do the things that they do. I think. I have a uh, uh, historical question about the uh, administration of forests. Uh, you talk about uh, three uh, English or uh, British, um, yes, British uh, administrative. Uh, the, the three first director were British, and then uh, a Thai people. I have two questions. Before uh, that period, I suppose the, uh, the, um, in the core, do, do they have? Um, uh, special per, uh, person who care about the, for, the rural forest before this uh, official administrative uh, the administration of forest. And the second question is the role of the, the monarchy during this period, during the 20s, 40s, uh, uh, 30s. What was the discourse of the monarchy about uh, the, the forest and this uh, creation of royal park? Well, in the early time, this I didn't mention in, in the talk because it would be too long, but in, in the early time, the um, logging benefits belong to the, the land, the, the northern king, the, the northern region, or Lana kingdom, the, the, the lord in the north. Um, Siam, the so Bangkok-based uh, uh, kingdom or the king, did not have any share in, in the benefit. 
but the problem occurred when the Lord um, in Chiang Mai sort of granted the land big concession. So you have um, the companies, you know, fighting with each other over the same land, um, the teak uh, forest land. So then the Siamese king stepped in um, and said that from now on the forest will not belong to uh, the Lana kingdom anymore. It will be part of the the property of the the Siam. So yeah, so it's a, a it's a, a, a part of the incorporation of a nod into the Siam. Uh, uh, Siamese arena, as well as the way in which to transfer the benefit and the control of the assets, you know, from the hands of certain laws to, to, to the Tai Chi. So um, it's not just peak alone, but minerals, river, things like that. <coughs> so you look at the department. <coughs> sorry, the, de <coughs> the department that was set up in that time, the mineral department. Probably land, what we were, I'm not sure. Irrigation department, they were all, you know, run by the foreigner, foreign ex uh, consultant, in order to make sure that you know all the resources will be well managed um, for the country. Have a more uh, factual question about the uh, uh, you, you you have mentioned at what. Well, Stage the uh, the number of hectares which uh, has been destroyed during the seventies uh, and and the nineties from the seventies to the nineties. Okay, can can you say, say it again, please? How, how many hectares? Uh, I think I think you mentioned which, which that. number? No. Probably the, the area that was flooded by then, do you think? Uh, uh, the number of uh, logged hectares of the forest between the uh, 1970s and the 1990s. Flooded by then? Yeah. Six dams, I think. Sorry? Probably six large dams, I think. I have to look at numbers. I'm oh, okay. at numbers it was, uh, was running to the dams. Yeah, I have to look at my notes. There is an old figures now. You know, you look at the. I did during the, the time I was I, I was writing this thesis. Babu Dam was not built yet. I think if you cover um, other dams too, the figure might be higher. Okay. No, no, sorry. That was my pro. Okay. The yeah, figure would be higher for sure. Yeah. Okay. Chim Farm no longer. I think my clothes were in very bad shape in terms of the situation. Oh. Chim Farm just destroyed all the metal. And now, now I didn't move elsewhere. Probably more to Cambodia. <laughs> the Chim industry. Okay. So, thank you very much. Do you have a, a word? A last question, maybe? Last question. Telling us about um, um, natural policy in Thailand in currently. It's about, um, can you share about idea, the policy of um, um, in this government about it's look like good, but um, a lot of um, people in the forest, they um, try to movement and they voice their voice, they have an impact from this policy. And just from my understanding, I think uh, um, government um, want to uh, increase the uh, forest area, but I cannot find another can answer. Can you help me? Thank you. <laughs> um, that's why it ends why 40% is a political question. If the government, you know, uh, use this figure as their legitimate uh, claim for the policy to, and the term to is really misleading uh, too. To means to to get back the forest, meaning the local villagers stole the forest from the nation. 
and now the government to you know get it back, and that's a very very kind of um, politicized rhetoric. Um, so to comment on this or to recommend this, <laughs> to criticize this. When you have uh, forestry policy in the hand of the military, then everything is new. The military only knows one thing, how to use gun to point to the head of the people and then move them out. And they, they don't even know the, 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 the value of the forest ecosystem. Military itself, you know, if to, to write another chapter on the military, that would be fun because military's role in forestry destruction is not minor either. The road construction by the army since uh, the Cold War period was massive, as well as you know other other kind of projects. So it's um, it's an, an interesting thing that in uh, the undemocratic um, political situation, you have this. Uh, major conservation become militarized, which should not be, you know, the direction. Because if you have this so-called nature, according to the nature conservationists, that it has its own law, above common law of the people, then how come it's become militarized? It will be very, very bad for the people, for sure. So my comment on this is we have to, I mean, forest, forest, I, I'm not sure if Forest Academy agree with this idea. But in, 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 in the community of the Forest Academy itself is divided. So for the inside you have this so-called the, uh, the militant wing and a more kind of flexible or compromising wing. So major conservation, if you, um, you know, the policy is uh, gearing towards that way, that it will create another kind of turmoil, political turmoil.